Welcome to the Evolution 2.0 podcast, where we explore the intersection of art, technology, business, biology, and spirituality. Here, you'll discover new trends in evolution that are changing the way we think about everything. This is your host, Perry Marshall, author of Evolution 2.0, 80-20 Sales and Marketing, and guides to Ethernet, Google, and Facebook. I'm founder of the Evolution 2.0 Prize, a quest for the missing link between earth science, the information age, and life itself. Let's join the conversation now. So, hey, this is Perry Marshall. I am here with Frank Ryan, and I have wanted to get Frank on the Evolution 2.0 podcast for quite a while because... Oh, I don't know how long ago, five, six, seven years ago, I read his book, Viralution, which is a fantastic read. One of the reasons you should read Frank's book is that he has this dual identity. He is also a fiction author. He's a very good fiction author, and he's a very good writer, and his books are much more interesting than most science books. And um, this book, Viralution, really... Um, I reference it several times in my, in my book, Evolution 2.0, and um, it helps you get a picture of how viruses are, you can almost think of them as the open source repository of genetic code floating around all over the earth and swimming around in the ocean. And then more yeah. recently, more recently, yeah, that's he's... That's a very good way of putting it, actually. That's... An extremely astute way of putting it there. Yeah. Well, he's put out this book called Virus Fear, um, which is fascinating. And then as well, on top of that, um, he has another book that I have called The Mystery of Metamorphosis, where he talks about um, very interesting and important symbiotic mergers that have happened in history. And Frank is, uh, in addition to all this, um, Frank is a, is a member of the Third Way of Evolution, which I think is one of the most important groups in evolutionary science. It's growing very fast. It's growing in prominence. And, uh, and you know, some old views of evolution are, are being swept uh, under the, uh, behind us now as, as we embrace the news. So for all of these reasons, I'm, I'm delighted to have Frank here with me. And we're going to talk about viruses, and um, and 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 so so Frank, um, you know, I'm sure that on airplanes and and uh, uh, or on the tube or or whatever, you you occasionally get into conversations with people, and um, you know they find out what you do, um, which is consultant physician and evolutionary biologist, and they find out that you're like a virus guy. And probably some of them go, like, I don't want any of those. So, um, you know, why, why would a human being find viruses so endlessly fascinating, Frank? Help, help well, us. Well, I think uh, I conducted my first ever experiment, actually, on rabbits to see how they'd react to a virus arriving in the blood, in the, into their circulation, circulatory blood, when I was a medical student a vast time ago. And I found in that experiment how powerful the mammalian evolutionary system, a mammalian immune system is. And at that time, my focus, like all doctors and like everybody, was on the diseases that virus cause. And they are very important. There's no question about that. Viruses are a cause of some, uh, some dreadful diseases and some milder diseases that tend to affect people in childhood. And basically, for the first half of my career, that was my perspective on viruses. And then I began to discover that perhaps there was a little bit more to them. Could it be that viruses are actually changing the evolution of their hosts? That was the first thing. That was what virolution is about. But then in the last, mm-hmm. in the, it's really only in the last 10 years or so, we're beginning to realize just how fundamental ro- a role viruses have played a in our evolution but b and this is the really new thing that in virusphere and it's a whole meaning of the term virusphere is what viruses are doing out there in the ecosystem in the biosphere 
And to be honest, if someone were to say to me, what would happen if all the viruses on earth were to disappear tomorrow? Mm. It would be the end of the world as we know it, I'm afraid. Now, that's Ooh. an extraordinary statement to make. Yeah. And I'll have to give the facts to, to support it. But I'm, it sounds as if I must be exaggerating. But actually, I'm not. <laughs> Actually, wow. I'm, I'm not. It's an ex so, so we're coming to some very important realizations about viruses. <laughs> okay, do you want me to? Oh, oh, please. Oh, yeah. Yes, this no. is. I, I was, but, I was taking right. notes okay. here. So, by all means, <laughs> okay. like, why well, would it I'm be the looking... end of the world if we lost well, all our viruses? <laughs> There's a thing called metagenomics that's come in in the last few years. In a way, I'm going to the end of my presentation, but it doesn't really matter because you can jump sure. around. Sure. And people have been looking at the oceans, and basically they began to discover that the, virus, the oceans are full of viruses. Vast number of viruses are residing in the oceans. And it isn't just in the surface waters, it's in every layer of the ocean from the top to the bottom, even in the sediment at the bottom. Now. Wow. Thankfully, these viruses have nothing to do with us. They're not remotely interested in us, which is, I think, a great relief. But what these okay. viruses are interested in, these are bacteriophage viruses. And the thing they prey on is bacteria. But they have a very odd relationship to bacteria. A, they interweave with bacteria. And their evolution is intimately bound up with the bacteria. But the other thing they do is that they infect the bacterium bacterium goes through its cycle and then at a certain stage in the bacterial cycle the viruses the bacterium is now full of viruses and it ruptures and it releases all those viruses out there and they all infect more bacteria and what they've actually discovered is there are gargantuan gargantuan cycles of life and death taking place all the time in all of the oceans hmm. And these are so important. First of all, think about it. If the viruses weren't infecting and destroying the bacteria in these great cycles, what would the oceans resemble then? They would be full of bacteria. They'd be a fetid, <laughs> fetid mass of something you just could, wouldn't want to get into, that's for sure. But what Wow, we, I never what, ever what, thought of that. What, we actually, what, what actually happens is, as a result of what's happening in the oceans, and this gargantuan mega cycles of life and death this is the basis of the nutritional web of the oceans because when the bacteria rupture and this is happening on a, a huge scale this is the basis of all the nutritional cycles of larger and larger beings in the oceans so if the viruses were to disappear you're beginning to see what might happen to the oceans of the world and also to the cycles of life in the oceans now, more recently, and this is only in the last 10 years or so, people in, in America, and most of this research is done in America, people began to look at soil, look, and they thought, what's happening in soil? They found exactly the same thing. Even in the soils in Antarctica, the bacteria and the viruses are cycling. So mm -hmm. now this is too early for them to sort of make the comments I've made about the oceans, but it seems very likely that We've also got this virus bacterial cycling at the basis of the food webs on land. So I can't say that for certain, but if you look at the oceans, it seems likely, and we, I think it wouldn't be too difficult to extrapolate from there. So now we've got a role in the biosphere that we didn't know viruses had. Well, so, you know, most people think of bacteria as bad. The yeah. truth is, We'd die in 12 nanoseconds if we didn't have them because they sure, run sure, everything sure. in our bodies, Essential. right? And yeah. what you're saying as well, you can welcome viruses to the party as well because, you know, surprise, surprise, they're actually incredibly important um, cooperative elements of yes. the whole ecosystem. That's right. Now, if you look at the slide I'm looking at, with Anton de Barre, uh, the guy who thought up the idea of symbiosis as far back as 1878. What did he call symbiosis? He called it the living together of differently named organisms. Mm. And that's what we're looking at. That's mm. exactly. So I think the viruses 
are symbiotes. <laughs> wow. Well, so that's a, that's a, um, so that's a twist. So now in your book, you know, you've got yeah. these stories of these horrible viruses like SARS and bird flu yeah. and all this, and, and yeah. they kill people. And there's a, there's kind of an element of your book that's almost like, it's almost like, hey, Han Solo, we got to put you in the deep freeze. And I know you're not really happy about that, but, you know, there's a higher purpose in all this. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, we, if we're, you know, um, <laughs> maybe the, the, you can help Han Solo um, yeah. accept his, uh, his deep freeze um, if, if you can. Like, uh, why, why are these things actually helpful to us? And what's really going on yeah. here? Well, viruses don't pretend to be good. They don't pretend to be immoral. They can't, it's impossible. They're tiny little things. They have no sense of morality. They are, by definition, amoral. But yeah. so we got to look at what does symbiosis include to understand them? And I've now okay. put a different side up and it's parasitism. Now, when I was a medical student and for most of the time when I was a doctor, categorized as obligate genetic parasites. That was the definition. But symbiosis is much broader than that. And if you look, mm. we've got, it includes parasitism, it includes commensalism, and it includes mutualism. Now, parasitism is what we've just been talking about. Commensalism is when an organism lives in another, or lives by another, takes advantage of the other, but doesn't cause it any harm. And the third one, mutualism, is the interaction between a bioorganism we're saying an interaction between different species of organisms and that and which two or more of the partners benefit so these are all included within the definition of symbiosis they've always been included right from the first definition but the if you think about it what then are viruses viruses actually follow all of those patterns different viruses with different relations a friend of mine called Marilyn Rosink, who's a professor of botanical virology in America, she went to Costa Rica. She was, I, I wrote a paper about this and a book called Darwin's Blind Spot, in which I compare symbiosis to mutation plus selection, neo Darwinism. And mm -hmm. when she read the book, she said, Right, Frank, I'm going to test it. And she went out and tested it. it she tested it in computer uh, analogy for into the field, if you want, and looked for viruses doing what I said they were doing. And actually, she found them straight away. Now, when she went to Costa Rica, she took this further. She looked at virtually all of the plants in Costa Rica, and she deliberately searched the plants for viruses in healthy plants. Mm. And in 70% of the plants she tested in that single experiment, she found viruses in plants that were causing no disease, but were present in all the plants. And that, I would say, fits the central part of that. That's commensalism. So viruses are commensals as well as parasites and as well as being mutualists. They, they can be any of those. So, so how is a virus mutually supportive of an organism and not just hitching a ride? Yeah, it doesn't, I don't think it thinks about it and it doesn't do it automatically but the thing is now what one of the aspects i'd like to discuss in more detail of this and i'm going to move on right is the partners in a symbiotic relationship are called symbionts and the relationship is called a holobiont it's just the symbiosis just a word for that symbiosis can take place at metabolic level and that that doesn't usually happen with viruses they don't usually produce a metabolite that's good for the say the host or for a partner, but many symbioses are like that, like hummingbirds and flowers and so on. Uh, symbiosis can be behavioral and like think of the feeding stations on the, on the bottom of the ocean. You've got these huge fish groupers of sharks. Little fish come along and cle clean out the mouth or shrimps do this as well. Anywhere else that shrimp or the cleaner fish is food. In the cleaner station it isn't. That's a behavioral symbiosis, okay? Genetic symbiosis, and that's what we're now going to talk about, is deeper, much deeper. And genetic symbiosis means that an organism from a certain evolutionary lineage actually gives a gene, at its simplest, 
to another completely different evolutionary lineage. That gene has pre-evolved to do something. The, the, the host that's gaining it, if you want, is given the gift of this gene, doesn't have that ability. But if that gene goes into the host, now the host has the potential of using the gene for a completely new purpose. And that's what we call genetic symbiosis. Now, the most powerful form of genetic symbiosis is when a whole genome enters a different genome. So you get a host and a genome, it doesn't have to be something small to enter it. So it could be a bacterium or it could be a virus. Now, our mitochondria, which enable us to breathe oxygen, were once upon a time, a long, long time ago, independent bacteria that discovered a way to breathe oxygen. Nowadays, all of the oxygen breathing life forms on Earth have a bacterial like mitochondrium derived from that single symbiosis. They, they're slightly bigger genomes and so on, but inside our cells, our mitochondria reproduce by budding, which is what you'd expect of a bacteria. They have a bacterial genome which replicates at a different time to when our nuclei do, uh, do reproduce. Uh, they behave as independent little organisms, but what they give us is the gift of breathing oxygen. That's a genetic symbiosis. And if you believe the evolutionary biology, it only ever happened once. So all of those oxygen breathing uh, animals and plants and all sorts of other things on earth, they've all evolved, they've all inherited, if you want, that genetic symbiosis. And it gives you an idea of how powerful a genetic symbiosis is. Can you, I've also given you a picture of a parasitic wasp. And I'm going to explain a different aspect of viral symbiosis here. If you look at that, you see this picture of the, of the caterpillar, green caterpillar, it's quite large occupying most of the screen. Yeah. On its tail, there's a little black thing. That's a parasitic wasp. When the parasitic wasp lays its eggs in the caterpillar, the egg is coated with, the next slide, viruses. Those are called polydna viruses. The extraordinary thing is the viruses may live around the ovaries of the wasp, but many of them have actually moved the genomes into the genome of the wasp. So when the viruses emerge, as the eggs have been laid, the viruses come out of the wasp cell, coat the eggs, and deposited to the caterpillar. What do they do in the caterpillar? The first thing they do is they block the caterpillars reaction with the eggs, because its immune system would destroy them. Then it stops the caterpillar metamorphosing to become an adult. Third thing it does, it causes the caterpillar's metabolism to manufacture food for the wasp larvae, which emerge from those eggs. Then the unfortunate uh, caterpillar dies, the wasp larvae swarm out and become wasps. They, it was possible to discover how many species of these there are in nature. I, this is an old slide. And I've said approximately 25,000 species of these wasps in nature, with approximately 20,000 species of polydon viruses. That's grown. Wow. That's grown. Okay, and we've gone to the next slide, which is extraordinary. They've worked out when this symbiosis began. 73.7 .7 million years ago. So, one, some wasp and virus formed a symbiosis 70, roughly 74 million years ago, so successful that now you've got all these different species on which have developed from them because it's an extremely successful survival tactic. So genetic symbiosis, very, very powerful. Okay, now I want to move on to something that's much more interesting to you and me. That's the human genome. You know, I've written about this in books and so on. <clears throat> the human genome is twice holobiontic because we've got, the, we've got the mitochondria, which were originally bacteria. And that's very special because if you get disease of mitochondria, if you get a mutated gene in the mitochondria, think about the genetics. What is the genetics going to be like? It's one of the commonest causes of certain uh, diseases that cause poor oxygenation in 
newborn babies. It's a very mm. severe, very important disease. But if think about it, how is it inherited? It's not inherited in any of the normal genetic manners. It has to come from the mother, because only the mother's mitochondria contribute to the formation of the gametes. They, we men, we just give the baby our genetics. We give them our genes, but we don't give them a cell. The mother gives the ovum, which is a cell, and it contains mitochondria. So all mitochondrial disease are inherited from the mother. And there are all sorts of other aspects of it that are different from normal inheritance because of what mitochondria are. And at first, you can imagine the genetics were ex extremely difficult to work out. But that's one of the consequences of an old symbiotic union with way, way into the distant past. And here you see the mitochondria on the next slide, and they're dividing like bacteria, because that's what they are. Okay. I'd like the, uh, I've got uh, this poor little boy in Britain, who's famous last year, people were trying to save him. He was born with a mitochondrial mutation and they mm. couldn't help him. There was nothing they could do to help him. His brain didn't develop. Parents moved him somewhere in Europe where someone was agreeable to do something, but of course, there was, he didn't survive. But it show, I'm just showing you how serious it is when something goes wrong with uh, something like this. And it, exactly the same thing, in a way, applies to the human genome. Okay? I've made, I've also given diseases caused by mitochondria. And to understand everything you've got to understand how the mitochondria came about in the first place. And I'm now back to viruses. I put a slide up to say, all right, how do we define what a virus is? Well, we all know it's very small. <laughs> Most of them yeah. are so small, you can't see them under the highest power of the light microscope. So they're tiny organisms. Mm. Uh, there's a big hoo-ha about 10 years ago when some two French microbiologists who are bacteriologists uh, said, asked the question, do viruses belong? Are they live life forms? And do they form part of the tree of life? Now, they made a great fuss about this, but in fact, every, from whichever way you look at viruses, they're not cellular organisms. They don't have a cell wall. They don't divide like cellular organisms. They don't have the metabolism of cellular organs. So the first part of a triple definition is viruses are non-cellular organisms. Okay, now this slide with all the funny little appearances of viruses on them illustrates the second point of what viruses are. These, the reason these viruses take all these peculiar shapes, they can look multifaceted like a diamond, or they can look like a sphere, or they look like a, one of these limpid, the mines, you know, with spikes, or some of them look like extremely elongated worms. How do viruses then contain all their living material or their inner material if they don't have cell walls? And the answer is they have something called a capsid. No other organism on earth has a capsid. No other organism on earth codes for a capsid. So second part of our definition is a virus is a capsid encoding organism. So you've got its non-cellular, and it's a capsid encoding organism. Okay. Now the next thing, they criticize viruses, these two guys, they said, because they can't replicate by themselves. So that means they're not life forms. Actually, there are not quite a few bacteria that can't replicate by themselves, and they are life forms. And, mm. and what I'd say then is, look at us. If, if, if we didn't breathe oxygen, what would happen to us? We'd die. But all of the oxygen in the atmosphere is manufactured by life. It doesn't come from rocks breaking up or anything like that. It comes from life. We're dependent yes. on other life forms for our oxygen. We're dependent on other life forms for our essential amino acids, for our vitamins, for our essential fats, and everything else. Everything on this planet is dependent on other organisms for life, except for a few bacteria that are called autotrophs. They can live on an inert rock. Everything else is dependent on other life forms. And so the fact that viruses are dependent on the host to replicate doesn't mean they're not life forms. If you apply that, none of us would be life forms. If you said that you can't do anything, you can't replicate, you can't live without other life forms, 
what would be left. So I think that is a, a false analogy to use for viruses. And I think what we need to say is we don't, we go away from the old definition of saying viruses were obligate parasites. We say viruses are obligate symbionts. And so now if we say non-cellular capsid encoding obligate symbionts, nothing else on earth other than viruses fill that category. So that is my definition of what a virus is. The fact that it's obligate is very important, okay? In a book called Virus X, I, put, I went around into plague zones, including the hantavirus plague in America, mm. and I had a fantastic, I was in a fantastic position because all these very knowledgeable colleagues were investigating the outbreak of an emerging virus in America, the most advanced country in the world. And so they let me in doing things, and I learned an enormous amount about emerging viruses. But the other concept I got is one of the things a virus can give to its host, one of the important things a virus has is aggression. It uses aggression, you could say almost constructively. You think mm. of the rabbit plague in, in Australia, the, the, the rabbit, the plague virus that killed all those millions and billions of rabbits was a symbiont of the Brazilian wood rabbit. <laughs> if, the, if instead of releasing the viruses, which, which is what they did in Australia, to cure a plague of rabbits, they released a rabbit plague virus on the rabbits. But if they'd brought in the Brazilian wood rabbit, what would have happened? The Brazilian wood rabbit, its virus would have slate wiped the Australian rabbits and the Brazilian wood rabbit would have taken over the ecology. But because the natural host of the virus wasn't there, something else happened. 99.8% of the rabbits in Australia died, but 2% survived. They mm -hmm. were resistant to the lethal effect of the virus, well, made them sick, but they were resistant. Within a very short time, like 10 or 20 years, there was no other uh, rival. So now the rabbit that could withstand the presence of the virus, they're now multiplying. And now the rabbits in Australia have their own myxomatosis virus, which no longer kills them. They've now come to accommodation. So now you've got virus-host relationship, which is developing. And what that virus would have done is it would have changed the uh, species gene pool of the rabbit. So it's now a species gene pool that can live with the presence of the virus. That's happened again and again and again in human history. Okay, so and the pattern is, the pattern is virus comes along, it kills 98%, but the 2% now- 0.2%. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the 0.2% yes. <laughs> have gained some kind of, so I, I, I'm getting the impression from uh, what you're saying that it's not just that the surviving rabbits had a resistance, but they also gained some sort of an advantage. Yes, that's Help true. Well, it's, amongst rabbits, you'll have slight differences in their genomes. And the genome, I'm talking about the part of the genome that deals with infection. So what has now happened is the virus has culled the rabbits so that only a tiny minority that had a particular type of genome that deals with infection has survived. Now, when that now becomes the whole rabbit gene pool. So it's actually changed the rabbit gene pool so that what was previously a minority amongst them is now the majority. And it will continue to interact with the rabbits in this way, slowly changing things, changing that and so on, until they live together in a perfect kind of harmony. You could say to me, why don't we eliminate influenza? It comes along every year, we're threatened by it. Every now and then you get a massive uh, uh, epidemic that kills a lot of people. Why can't we get rid of it? The answer is the natural host of influenza isn't us. The natural host is wild fowl, wild ducks, wild, you know, ordinary mm. wild fowl. Mm. It's, it doesn't kill them. It doesn't do anything to them. It doesn't cause any disease. It lives with them because it's already gone through the same cycle that the myxomatosis thing did with the rabbits. So unless we eliminated all the wild fowl of the world, we're not going to eliminate influenza. 
Hmm. The point I'm making is plagues, even AIDS, are, this is the conclusion. I, went, all, I wrote a number of books, Virus X, Darwin's Blind Spot, Viral Illusion, and so on. And the conclusion I arrived at is that plagues, even AIDS, are actually evolutionary phenomena. You, can't, you mustn't look at it from our little human perspective. Look at it from the broad global perspective. The way in which viruses interact like this, you're looking at an evolutionary phenomenon. And this has implications at the most fundamental level. Okay. Now. So, 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 Frank, we got, I, why? All right. Why are? The, I, let me get philosophical with you for, here for a second. Yeah. Uh, a little bit philosophical. So, how does this change our view of the world? So, if if I said, well, Frank, most of us are not looking at this correctly. And you said, well, I have a little bit of a better way for you to think about these things. Um, how should I be thinking about, it sounds like um, not, not only viruses, but even other diseases and things like that. I should, we, we should have a somewhat different point of view. Can you help me understand? Well, I, I, I certainly not claim that disease, these diseases aren't harmful to us. I don't cause, I'm a doctor. Of course. Cause terrible course. effects. But the thing is we're looking from a personal and human point of view. What were evolutionary phenomena are very brutal, very cruel. They, they, there isn't any sort of Christian kindness in it. <laughs> If you want yeah. to put it that way, they, they don't, they, nature is, is extremely brutal. Watch your wildlife films on television. It's very, very brutal. So these, it's part of life. At the moment, there are, now, interesting, there are two plagues going on right now. One of them is in the squirrels here in Britain. And the reason for the plague in the squirrels is because people brought the American gray squirrel into Britain. And the American gray squirrel squirrel has a pox virus that it's symbiotic with. It's doing to the red squirrel what Brazilian wood rabbit would have done to the Australian rabbit if it had come in with this virus. In this case, the gray squirrel has come in with this virus, and the red, the red squirrel is becoming, uh, is basically being wiped out. People are getting up in arms about it, and they're trying to do this, that, and the other. But in fact, they won't be able to stop it unless they use some kind of extraordinary uh, evolutionary technique to do it. And they don't, they're not even thinking along those lines. So the red squirrel in Britain, apart from little pockets, is going to become extinct. But now in Australia, there's a different plague virus of the koalas. Now this is a retrovirus. And a retrovirus began in the north of Australia about 120 years ago. By the time the people in Australia, you know, the biologists and so on, realized that it was amongst them, millions of koalas were dead, just like ha happened in our AIDS epidemic. 100% of the koalas in Northern Australia are now infected. Sexual spread, it shows you, sexual spread of a virus is extremely efficient. You wouldn't have thought <laughs> of the koalas. You wouldn't think koalas were all that sexually, uh, you know, or adventurous, shall we say, but it's all of the koalas in Northern Australia infected. Two thirds of them down halfway down the coast and a third at the bottom. So in other words, it's moved from the north to the south. It isn't going to kill them all any more than the uh, plague and rabbits actually killed all of them. Some are surviving, but the interesting thing again is it's invading their genome. Retroviruses invade the genome. The koalas, some koalas have now got a hundred insertions. By insertions, what we mean is the genome of the retrovirus is inserting into the chromosomes. To be honest, that's how the retrovirus reproduces. It normally, it normally it's in the host cell. It goes into the host target cell, which is usually a lymphocyte or a blood cell. And the virus inserts itself into the chromosomes. In the chromosomes, the viral genome is called a provirus. It makes the genome make more viruses. That's how it, that's how it works. But some retrovirus, didn't all of them, some, accidentally perhaps, or deliberately, I don't know, they actually invade the germ cells. Now it means every time this animal or human or whatever reproduces, viruses there in the chromosomes. So it's automatically reproduced. So, uh, so oh, Frank, 
Frank, you, you have a book called Darwin's Blind Spot. And yes. one of the things that you say is that um, we have this 21st century connotation of natural selection and survival of the fittest. And it's not really what he meant by it. No, um, no. Darwin never explain yeah. uh, about I that. I can. Yeah, that's a really important point because Darwin used the term natural selection. And to be honest, it's an innocuous term and an innocuous idea in a way, because all he's saying is that if people, and he, he didn't know about genes, he didn't know about modern genetics or anything like that, but he realized that, you know, children look like the parents, they inherit their characteristics from their parents. And he knew heredity as a concept. And basically, what he was saying is in a, in a species, for a species to change, which is what he was thinking about, heredity has to change. It'll change little bit, bit by bit, a little bit at a time. If the person who gets an hereditary change has an advantage for survival, now it doesn't have to be something astonishing. An obvious example would be if they're slightly more resistant to smallpox, slightly more resistant to a, an infectious disease, something that gives them an advantage for survival. Since the change that did it is hereditary, it'll be passed on to the children. And they'll, and little by little, if it's a really powerful thing, you get the change in the family, the family gets more children spread out within a species. And because it's so powerful over a very long period of time, this becomes part of the species gene pool. He didn't use those terms, but that's what he was referring to. He, he wasn't talking about survival of the fittest, He's talking about some little change that gives a family or an individual an advantage in survival for some reason. That's all he was referring to. It was a guy called Spencer, Herbert Spencer, an English philo uh, social philosopher, came up with the concept of survival of the fittest, thinking that's what Darwin meant, but he got it completely wrong and it was completely misunderstood or even deliberately misunderstood because people who thought they were superior to others then used this and it led to social engineering, not allowing immigrants in, you know, this, all the usual things culminating in the most awful thing, of course, which was the death camps in, in Germany. But that didn't come from Darwin. He didn't ever, everybody was so excited about Spencer's idea during Darwin's lifetime, they tried to persuade him to change his term natural selection for survival of the fittest, but he refused. Oh, so interesting. That isn't down to Darwin. That's down to Spencer. And Spencer, oh, wow. at the end of his life, admitted, he says, I made a mistake. I wow. misunderstood. So you can see how important that was. Well, there's a lot of um, elitism that's always somehow been um, associated with this. Um, Frank, let me ask you something else. Um, you, you uh, in the notes before the call, one of the things that got mentioned was you the reaction that you get about this when you talk to religious scientists. Yeah, yeah. I thought I, that was a very uh, maybe that even dovetails with this. I, I think I, I think it was very interesting because everybody thinks that uh, you know if you're a scientist you couldn't be religious, and that's not true. Now no, I, no, I, it's I get, not. well a lot of a lot of probably more in this country than America, probably aren't, but you do, it doesn't necessarily mean you, you can't be religious and a scientist. And uh, when I was, I used to give, until this year, I gave a long, a five week series of talks at Sheffield University. Uh, I'm a doctor, so I think of evolution always in human terms. Mm. And I, I, I was giving a talks about the human genome and various other things. And then the guy who was with me, lectured with me, said, let's open it up and invite any colleagues who want to come from the university, especially he, he was interested in people who might ha have a religious interest or background or whatever. And so we did, and they did, they came along to the lecture. And mm. I gave a lecture with a lot of genetics and this kind of thing. And, it, and I was talking about the human genome and viruses and what they're doing. I haven't mentioned it yet in this talk, but we'll get to it. And when I finished, I, asked, I said to them, you know, what did you think of that? This was, we found it very interesting. We learned a lot of stuff that we didn't know before because they, they don't have my interest in this particular thing. And, but these are scientists. So I said, did, did you accept it? Did, you th you know, did it seem reasonable to you? And they said, yes, of course it is. We, they work with genetics. They, they're, you're not, they're not going to come back and say this. You've got a, a retrovirus that's a, a thousand nucleotides long 
and someone says that's in the human genome, and it isn't. I mean, the evidence for that is overwhelming compared to the sort of evidence that have put someone in jail, you know, for a murder or a rape or something, because they go on, you know, 10 little sites with four nucleotides. These are a thousand mm. nucleotides long. You couldn't mistake them. I yeah. said, well, what do you think of it? And I said, you yeah, know, he said, of course we accept it. And they, I said, then we had a chat about that. And they said to me, what are you looking for when you're studying evolutionary biology? And I said, well, I'm looking for the patterns. I'm looking at uh, mechanisms of how evolution works and how it progresses. In fact, if you eminent, very eminent forebears like Newton and uh, Einstein were the same, though, just looking for mechanisms, you know, the mechanisms, how planets stay up in the air or whatever it is, they're looking for mechanisms. I say, yes. They say, you're looking for rules in what you would call nature. I said, that's it, exactly. They said, we just say the rules were put there by God. We don't say, we replace the word nature. They said, that. Think of that. <laughs> I said, you, if you accept the science, which you do, I don't have any objection to how you view how these, the overall, you know, the sort of metaphysics, if you want, uh, in, in the background of where, how these happen and why, how they came into being. I, I said, I'm perfectly happy with that. I, I, in other words, we had no argument at all. There was no, discuss, no disagreement. Well, that's that's very similar to how people like Isaac Newton and James Clerk Maxwell and Boyle and Co Copernicus looked at things. They they looked at the universe as a a window into the mind of God because um, they the the presumption that created science was that God made a universe with discoverable laws that were orderly yeah. and structured. So, of course, you know it, I think there's a false um, dichotomy that in well as a as an American Christian I would absolutely say that it seems like American Christians have bought into this conflict thesis which is yeah. what the what the historians call it and then served to make it true unfortunately uh, yeah I thought, well I blame partly the neo-darwinians and uh, I, if I go on to if I can find it uh, come too far but I was going to I had a, a slide basically show the first publication of the selfish gene. I like, I can't, I'm not a critic of Dawkins, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is at the time that was published in 1976, the only mechanism of giving rise to the hereditary change I've been talking about earlier was mutation. Hmm. And mutation is a random, it, it's frequent. Each, you and me, we've got at least six different mutations that the mutations the other has because every child is born with about half a dozen or so mutations, even more than that. Because copying of DNA, is, I mean, the genome is exceedingly long. And if you get a, one or two little errors along the way in the copying, that's a mutation. But mm -hmm. most of these, they don't matter. A few small mutations here and there, unless they're in a critical area, they really don't matter. So how they saw evolution working then was mutation, which, is, which can be given, they can even apply a, mathem a sort of quantum, uh, a mathematics to, that, uh, uh, so you got a mutation arising by a predictable mathematical equation with natural selection selecting when it was useful. And so they applied a mathematics to evolution. And from that, this became so derivative that this, I think, in part precipitated all this kind of disagreement between religion and evolution of biology. But if you look at the table I gave you of hereditary change, different mechanisms that give rise to hereditary change, you've got others such as genetic symbiosis that we've been talking about. So it isn't as easily predictable. You can't apply mathematics actually to evolution overall. You can apply it to mutation, but not to the other mechanisms. And, I, and if we then take a step back and realize that things are more complex and that we really have, shouldn't be so dogmatic. If it, uh, things, uh, it mean, makes a lot more sense. Well, I, I, I completely agree. And we, we, we're coming to the end here. Um, yeah. one, you... one of the, uh, something I should tell you, and this is very important is, when I, in earlier books, 
I've written about the fact that we've got uh, endogenous retroviruses. In other words, retroviruses that once upon a time plague retroviruses affecting our ancestors got into our genome because of what we were talking about with the koalas. And mm. then people discovered about oh, 18 years ago or so now that one of those retroviral uh, uh, genomes inserted in chromosome 7 was making a protein called syncytin 1 and syncytin 1 was actually changing the human placenta. It was expressed, I've given you a slide of placenta I think, and you can see all the cell nuclei that's fused together. There's no break between the cells. It's eliminated the break between cells. So on the surface, the interface in the human placenta between the fetal circulation and the maternal circulation is an interface like a plastic membrane studded with nuclei. We mm. can't make that. Our human, you know, the vertebrate ancestors couldn't do that. That, they discovered that fusing of the cells was caused by an endogenous retrovirus in chromosome 7, and they call the protein it makes, it's the envelope gene of the retrovirus, it encodes for a protein, and they call it syncytin 1, because that's a syncytium. Then they found a second retrovirus on another uh, chromosome that also confused cells, but what it does is it resides in the placenta just below the level of the syncytium, and it stops the maternal immune system rejecting the baby, because the baby's half its antigens are from the father and are foreign to the mother. If the mother's immune system can get through that placental barrier into the fetus, it'll destroy the fetus because it's regarded as foreign. What's yeah. happened in the last 10 years is some French scientists have been investigating. Every, at first we thought maybe uh, we humans or our ancestors uh, kind of developed a placenta and the virus has improved upon it. That was how we thought about it up to 10 years ago. Some French scientists then began to look at all of the mammals and in every single placental mammal, they all have their own syncytin type one mm. and two. They're not the same virus, but the virus is doing exactly the same thing. Then they said, well, let's go to the, the marsupials don't have placentae. You know, the fetus comes out and pops into the pouch. But if they look at one or two marsupials go undergo transient placentation, lasts a few days, how does that happen? When they looked at the transient placentation, they find a syncytin one, syncytin two, endogenous retrovirus. And they've actually shown that it didn't, it wasn't that the viruses improved upon placentation. Placentation only took place because of the viruses. So in other words, endogenous retroviruses, I'm saying they're very special to us, endogenous retroviruses made possible the origin of, origin of placentation in the placental mammals. Now this is very new. This is only three years ago. This. Mm -hmm. And this is partly why I wrote Virusphere, because we never realized before that they've done something as important as that, because without placentation, you and I wouldn't be here. That's it. Virusphere by Frank Ryan, where he explains that, some, that a virus could be the open source code that, uh, that, uh, that the human body borrows and steals to build a part of the placenta. It's absolutely fascinating. Frank, I've got to, I've got to wrap up here, but I, I really want to give you some appreciation for this. And I'll really plug both of your books. Virolution is a great read. And then we have virus fear is a, um, more focused on like kind of the, the, the medical aspects of dealing with viruses. So I want to thank you for your work and salute you and Thank you for your interest. Uh, and I, I hope people will uh, pick up your book. So thank you very much for spending part of your evening with me today. Thank you very much. I'm now going to have a glass of wine. <laughs> All right. I, ho I well, hope you'll do the same. <laughs> I will. Take care, Frank. Appreciate uh, it. It's lovely to speak to you. Until next time, this is the Evolution 2.0 podcast, bridging science, technology, business, and the big questions. To ensure you never miss an episode, subscribe on iTunes or on your preferred player. 
If you like the show, rate us on iTunes. Join our email list and social media at CosmicFingerprints.com. <laughs>